Normally, I introduce the speakers, but for this particular presentation, I think that Mill Valley Historical Society board member Betty Girk is better suited to do so. Betty is a retired anthropology professor. She's the author of the book Chief Marin, Leader, Rebel, and Legend, among other books. She'll be our first uh, Wednesday speaker in April, here to talk about her newly published book about aviation called A Broken Propeller. Many of us, and me included, consider Betty to be the heart of the Mill Valley Historical Society. She, she's a personal mentor and friend to me, and we love her so. She is also an honorary tribal member for the Federated Indians of Grayton Rancheria, and she'll be the one that'll be introducing Greg Saris now. Betty? Thank you, Deborah. Wow, what a lovely crowd. How very nice. <clears throat> I'm honored to introduce Greg Saris this evening. As chairman of the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria, he represents the Coast Miwok and Pomo tribes, southern Pomo tribes, and the ancestral land included all of Marin County up to including southern Sonoma County. Mill Valley's connection to the Coast Miwok is significant. One of the past leaders of the Coast Miwok was Chief Marin who was born 200, over 230 years ago here on Locust Avenue in Mill Valley. <clears throat> Greg Saris is a man of many talents. Armed with a PhD from Stanford, he wrote the award-winning collection of stories, Grand Avenue, which became an HBO miniseries. This was followed by the novel Watermelon Nights about Santa Rosa. And now, with one hand, he's shepherding the tribe as a tribal chairman. And with the other hand, he's teaching at Sonoma State. And with another hand, he's helping uh, a tribal member with a serious health issue or working with the town of Santa Barbara, Santa Rosa, sorry, on environmental conditions. And there's also the hand that's advising literary groups and one that's receiving an award for a public television series, and a hand that's reviewing and rewriting scripts for Sundance Institute. However, the hands that I remember are the ones that he held out to tribal members in the early 90s here in Marin County. Local people were concerned that another tribe was coming in and building uh, on their property on Coast New York land. And Greg was called and w helped bring all of these people together, many of whom hadn't spoken for a while, many of whom were somewhat resident about stating that they were indeed Coast New York Indians because of past prejudices. <clears throat> and many who hadn't seen each other, as I said, many hadn't seen each other for a while. So he held out his hand to help, and <clears throat> he gave voice to the local Coast Miwok people and listened to their stories. He helped to create a sense of unity and encouraged them to seek recognition as a tribal nation from the federal government. I observed firsthand his kindness, his patience, and respect at tribal meetings, tribal luncheons, and tribal picnics. And I want you to remember these words, patience, kindness, and respect, because that, to me, is the essence of Greg Sarris. Eight years later, the work paid off, and the tribe was recognized in the year 2000 as a sovereign nation. Greg is a masterful storyteller, whose productions are rich in authentic details, as well as suffused with, suffused with gentle humor. He just finished a chapter 
for Save the Redwoods League and told about love medicine, a story about love medicine. Apparently, love medicine is best found in the forest, in the redwood forest, where the sap of the oldest redwood tree had the magic ingredient because it had the longest memory. You will find these qualities in his new book, How a Mountain Was Made. I hope you have a chance to look at it. And don't miss the story about Coyote and the Skunk. Greg. <laughs> she said that wasn't true and I have to admit this because my assistant Angela Harden is here and my cousin Tucci Colombo is here uh, tribal citizens um, patience I don't always have that bit <laughs> so because um, I could just see them the two of them rolling their eyes and my good friends Mark and Jane Chapatari uh, might be rolling their eyes also um, in any event, uh, it does, I do, we, one of my mottos with the folks are always take the high road and, and uh, try to hold on and all of that. Um, we've had a pretty bizarre and interesting history. Um, I want to start tonight, since you're the Historical Society, um, to just talk a little bit, I don't know how much you know, you've had, you've had the honor of having Betty Gerke amongst you, so you know a lot about the local history, a lot of the local Indians, but for those of you who don't, I'll give you kind of my three, five minute overview of the folks who lived here uh, as a way to lead into the stories and to tell you what you might not want to hear about Mount Tamalpais, under whose shadow we sit. But uh, any, in any event, it's interesting to note that at the time of European contact in this area, uh, Moran, Sonoma, and Lake Counties, parts of Mendocino County, hosted, uh, was home to the densest population of native people anywhere in the New World outside of the present site of Mexico City and that's only because that was the Aztec capital. There were more people here speaking more languages than anywhere else in the entire New World. And many of those languages were as different as English is from Chinese. Let me begin by saying there was never such a thing as a Coast Miwok tribe or a Pomo tribe. Those are classifications by linguists. Linguists classify groups of people by language families. So for instance, Coast Miwok speakers, which are basically from oh, a little north of Petaluma or Katati, south to the Golden Gate Bridge, that's a Penutian language. And parts of the Penutian language go up to Alaska, Canada, uh, the Midwest. And then the Pomo, which are north, that's a Hokan language. And those languages go into uh, the Southwest and into Oaxaca. In fact, in Mexico, man, many of the native Oaxacan languages are related to Pomo language. They're, they're similar. I mean, it's quite a distance. And then another interesting factor in with the Coast Miwok, all of the Coast Miwok folks in this area and say up to Bodega Bay could understand each other. There were variations within that language that were about as different as Old English to Modern English, let's say. Whereas you go to the Pomo areas, the coastal Pomo could not understand the Lake County Pomo, that, those languages would be as different as, uh, say, uh, French to Italian to Spanish, something like that. There was much more variation within that language family. But we never, ever thought about ourselves in terms of Coast Miwok or Pomo until we were classified much later by the linguists and had to take those terms because of the, gov the history, the government history uh, with us. But um, we mostly always, always, associated, we lived here in small nation states, 500 to 1,000 people, with often a couple central villages and then many smaller temporary villages that we'd move to in the summertime uh, and so on and so forth. Often your uh, aboriginal territory was no more than 20 square miles and you often didn't go further than 30 miles from your original village your entire life. So the consequence of so many people living so close together is you knew the landscape intimately and you were responsible for that landscape. We knew where every quail laid its eggs, every duck laid its eggs. We knew the deer. You knew the landscape intimately. You also, all the villages were often 
in most cases, organized around bodies of water, creeks, lakes, lagoons, um, sloughs, and so forth, um, for a variety of reasons, uh, obviously because there was water there, but also it was interesting because um, you were responsible for the body of water where you lived, and if you didn't take care of it, it would, you would get in trouble with the other people because the water was all connected. So for instance, if you lived up on the hills where you're on a creek or some kind of creek, you were responsible to keep that water clean and good because if you didn't, the people down in the lagoon would get mad and wouldn't let you go down there and get water potatoes or something like that. Likewise, if you didn't take care of the lagoon, people up in the creek might poison the water and get you in trouble down below. So the health, we had, you know, you know how we fished? Uh, buckeyes, you know what, buckeyes are very poisonous and if you smash them and throw them in the water, the fish get drunk and float around and we pick them out. But anyway, um, the, the people would, again, you, the health of the people was reflected in the health of the water. All right. So the political health was reflected in the environmental health. Some lessons we might learn today. Um, uh, in any event, um, the d landscape, of course, was diverse. The redwoods on the coast and the drier lands. And then, of course, a very a lot of animals here. The flatlands and the valleys were much like the savanna with great herds of elk and pronghorn huge herds moving uh, everywhere. And essentially, they weren't afraid of people. Um, they would move away. What began to make the animals, including the birds, frightened were the gunshots of the colonists. They'd hear the guns and learned very quickly to associate that with death and terror. And so, again, we, we had this very intimate knowledge. And people often said, the ethnographers often said, how was it that so many people speaking so many different languages could live in the same place for up to 10,000 years with virtually little physical warfare? <coughs> Were they just dumb? <laughs> now, the Europeans, including Ginebra Serra, thought we were really dumb. Unfortunately, he decided we weren't dumb enough not to come and baptize us or colonize us all. But remember, we have a tendency to see other cultures and people in terms of our own eyes. So the Europeans always thought the Plains Indians, hence Hollywood and everything, they always thought the Plains Indians were the most sophisticated because they had what Europeans understood best, organized warfare. We were much more subtle. We poisoned you and you dropped dead the next day. <laughs> and the Europeans did not understand that at all. And we, the average work day here was about an hour spread over the year. They couldn't stand it. We were naked, we wove baskets, and we had a lot of secret, complicated religious cults. I asked Mabel McKay, the last homo medicine woman, well, what do people do all the time? Now, obviously, when the salmon were running or the acorns were falling, you long work days. But the rest of the time, you had a lot of time here. And she said, we, bow, we wove baskets and thought about God. Now, really, who's stupid? A life of art and religion and philosophical thought? Not so bad to me. Spanish come, of course, the first two laws that they impose on us are a law against bathing, because they didn't like nudity. So they put us all in clothes. You know, those Indians, they can't, we can't see genitalia. Um, and a law against burning. We did control burning. And what they thought we were doing was burning the land so their cattle and horses couldn't eat. Didn't get it. But still, the question remains, how did so many people speaking so many different languages, live, living so close together, virtually have no physical warfare? Well, again, we had a, uh, there was usually the political structure was such that you had a chief usually, but the chief was selected by often of four elder women. You could nominate a son, you could nominate your brother, uncle, father, whomever, but these women picked who they wanted. And then they trained them for many years in the art of leadership and elocution. Again, something that might be good today. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then he would act. But he was mostly a handmaiden of sorts, if you will, 
for the dreamers who would ha know when the salmon were going to come, when it was best to hunt, and he would organize the people accordingly and give speeches and so on and so forth. There was no centralized religion as we know it. There were a lot of secret cults. People belonged to many different cults. Sometimes they were international or between nations, like the women's bear cult, the, women, the grizzly bear cult, where the women would go at night and wear uh, the grizzly bear hides and travel. We used to say if you had a relative, if you uh, woke up in the morning and you were living up far away from the coast and you had a, some clams in a gunny sack on your back porch in the morning, you had somebody in your family who was a bear, she went and got the clams for you. Um, but then still, what was it? What permeated our culture was the notion that everything in nature and in life and in human life had power. Power that you might not understand and power that was unique to it. So I might be a good person, but I have songs that were given to me, songs that I have, so that if you violated me or somebody, your brother or your mother would drop dead the next day, or they'd trip and fall. With certain things would happen. Things came back on you fast. And in that way, physical warfare was considered the lowest form of warfare because it indicated you had no what? Spiritual power. And that way anybody could attack you or do anything without fear of retribution. Now, the, coast, the southwestern Pomo, the Kashaya Pomo, their word for white people is pa'achai, which means miracles. And I always used to ask old people, why do you call white people, why do you call Europeans miracles? And they said, because when they were coming here and they were killing people and chopping down trees and damming up the water and killing animals, instead of getting punished, more of them kept coming. And we thought they were miraculous. <laughs> but of course, as we know today, <coughs> Everything is poisoned. It's all come back. It just took time. There's not a body of water anywhere that you can drink outside. It's all poisoned. The air, everything. It's all come back. So, again, there's not a racial component to uh, karma, let's say. Um, all right. So, um, you know, and again, we then suffered, as you, I'm sure Betty's talked about, the brutal history. The last, well, one of the second to the last mission that was here was in San Rafael, and then Sonoma, and we were moved and shunt around and so forth. Um, the Mexicans um, came and they duplicated the basically the Spaniards and the Portuguese slave model that was used throughout Central and South America. Now, the, because they're Catholic, the Pope would not let people have slavery, right? That was forbidden, but they got around it very easily. They created in South and Central America indentured servitude vagrancy laws, and convict leasing, all right? So you had to belong to somewhere or somewhere. You had to have a tag. Otherwise, if you're walking around, you go in jail. If you go in jail, we sell your labor. Uh, indentured servitude. You can't live on the land unless you're working for me and paying rent. So the Mexicans came here, and once we were released from the prisons, the, or excuse me, the, you know, prison, that was a slip. The missions were secularized. <laughs> the missions were secularized. The Mexicans, we were given 500 acres in Nicasio, but we couldn't really live on it. So General Vallejo, who had 60,000 acres, uh, took us, many of us in, and again, used us virtually as slaves, using those methods that had been used for a century, at least, throughout the Caribbean and everywhere else. Then, of course, California, 1850 becomes a state. The first piece of legislation that was enacted in the state of California was called the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, which legalized Indian slavery. And guess who helped draft that law? The very man who was defeated by the Americans, General Vallejo, because he knew it so well. Using vagrancy laws, convict leasing, and indentured servitude. That law was not repealed until three years after the Civil War in 1868, so that our, my ancestors were sold in Santa Rosa on Saturdays, their labor was sold, and so on, and, uh, while African Americans could own land, and here in California. Pretty ugly history, and then we had to live wherever we could after that. Uh, to make a very long story short, so I can get to the good, fun reading, and so on and so forth, um, 
there were approximately, there's various numbers of Pomo and Coast Miwok, but close to the ancestral territory of my ground, my ground family here in Marin and Southern Sonoma County, anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 natives at the time of contact. Today of the 1,400 enrolled members in my tribe, all of us are the descendants of 14 survivors, all of whom were women, who were either concubines or wives of early Spanish, Mexicans, or Americans. Tuch and I go back to the same woman, Supu, who was 14 years old when Ven General Vallejo took her from the Aboriginal they, they village. 1700, all our family. Yeah, um, mm. she was taken from the village by General Vallejo. She's from Petaluma, which means slope ridge. There was an Indian village, it means it goes to like slope or sloping ridge. Vallejo took her into his fort here. The Mexicans were quite brutal to the young girls. She walked 50 miles barefoot up to the Russian territory, Fort Ross, and there had three children uh, by a man named Komshital, uh, who was what they call a Creole. He was Indian, Aleut, and Russian. And then when the Russians abandoned the fort in 14, or excuse me, 1842, she went down and became the maid slash mistress for Captain Stephen Smith, who had the first steel mill. And Tooch comes from that line. I come from the bad mixed other line. But uh, we all go back to the same woman. Uh, and it, it, that story is quite pervasive throughout the tribe. Um, anyway, it's miraculous that the stories, that the stories somehow persisted. And until 1878, Tunch's aunt, she was the last fluent speaker of Coast Miwok. And now, of course, we're reviving the language. But it's amazing that stories were passed down in the families. And despite this history, the language, the stories survived. And there used to be cycles of stories that people would tell in the winter, where the stories would go on and on, and they would tell them all night long, and so on and so forth. And one of the things I wanted to do is create for my people, first, they were published in the tribal newsletter each month, a cycle. I wanted to reimagine a cycle of creation stories. The creation stories about coyote took place in a time before this one, when all the animals were people. We have the complete inverse of this whole notion of evolution that we ascribe to here. Ascribe to here. Um, you know, Indians joke, they say, if you really want to know what white people think about, look and see who they think their ancestors are. Um, but um, the, the very notion is that all the animals were people. And then basically what happened is that coyote got greedy and deer grew long and tried to kill deer and she grew long legs and ran away and this one grew wings and flew away and this one did various things so people are kind of the dumbest they're on the bottom and our job in life is to remember our humility and be humble in the face of those that are smarter than us and our job is to try to communicate and get back with them so it's a complete flip-flop so, you know, I was watching, I grew up probably like a lot of you in the Cinderella stories and all these hero stories and all that, you know, the Western children's stories. If you suffer long enough, the prince will come and women, you know, that that usually doesn't happen. So you grow up disappointed and miserable. But, um, uh, you know, all of these stories that emphasize the individual and suffering and hard work and the individual rather than the community. The Indian stories were much different. And in this pre, pre, this time before this one, the animals were always, coyote and others were acting up, but then they got in trouble. So um, anyway, I thought I'd start doing this. And I thought it wouldn't just be good for, you know, obviously the young Indian kids in my tribe, but I thought these stories would be great, a great antidote to the so-called hero stories that most of us grew up with. Um, and I thought, today we need these kinds of stories more than ever. I was so arrogant to think as much. But um, in any event, so I began writing this cycle of stories, and I wrote 16 stories. And um, it takes place, they all take place on Sonoma Mountain, where it is said among Coast Miwok people and Southern Pomo, that's where Coyote created the earth and people. He was living up there with his wife, Frog Woman. And of course, uh, he was always a bad guy, as he was always trying to be with her and he was very selfish and she had two sons, right? And uh, one day when she was down uh, 
leaching acorns or something in the creek. He took one sun up and threw, he became the moon and he threw another sun up and he became the sun. And when she came back to camp, she said, where are the kids? And he said, well, you know, you never have time for me, woman. So I got rid of them. She said, what? And she began to cry and cry and he said, you know, you can look up and see one in the day and you can look up and one see one at night and you should be happy. But she kept crying and crying and he got fed up and he said, go jump in a lake and she did and she's been there ever since. And that is why when you see the frog, she's always sitting looking up like this. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, I will start and I'll just kind of start with uh, the book here. Um, and I'm trying to find my other notes, which I am not finding. Um, hold on one second. Um, I had something that I, oh, here we go. I thought, how did they disappear? Magic, someone's poisoning me. Um, some of my relatives, too, chill now say, don't listen to anything he says, he's full of, that's a good sign in Indian country. Okay. So, um, I'm going to just kind of read from the very first part so you get a sense of what's going on, and then I'll read one of the actual stories. And if there's time and Betty doesn't want to ask questions, I'll do the skunk story. I didn't think of that, Betty. You should have told me ahead of time. I'm, I'm very well behaved. I'll do what you tell me. All right. Um, so, I start off, basically, this is the story of Sonoma Mountain. It isn't one story. It is many stories that make up the one story. The stories go on and on because the mountain itself has so many things, rocks and animals, birds and grasses, fish, frogs, springs and creek, trees, and each thing has a story. Many of the stories connect with other stories. This makes sense because the animals and plants and all other things on Sonoma Mountain connect with one another. The mountain has always been a special place for Costa Miwok people. The stories from the mountain teach important lessons and many of the songs that Coast Pe Miwok people have sung since the beginning of time are gifts from the mountain and come from the stories. It is said that Coyote was sitting atop Sonoma Mountain when he decided to create the world and people. But that is part of the big story of the mountain and we are getting ahead of ourselves. The best way to hear the story is, is to listen to Coyote's twin granddaughters, Answer Woman and Question Woman. Some people say they are a pair of crows that sit on a fence rail partway up the mountain near the place folks call Gravity Hill. Other people swear answer woman and question woman are human. These people claim to have seen the twins, two identical looking women with long dark hair leaning against the same fence rail, talking. In any event, answer woman and question woman have been on Sonoma Mountain a long time. They are the daughters of Coyote after all. They know all the stories. But this is their predicament. Answer woman knows all the answers, but she cannot think of them unless she's asked. Question woman, on the other hand, cannot remember a single answer, not one story, and she must always ask her questions in order to hear the answer again. So, here they are talking before this story. One day, after Answer Woman told the story about Lizard and Mockingbird kidnapping Rock's three bird daughters, Answer Woman was reminded of something else she needed to tell her sister about the stories and life on Sonoma Mountain. Remember when I said, if we only see a poppy as a flower, if we don't know its story, then we can't learn any lessons from it? I don't remember. Don't you remember? I said, if grass is just grass or a rabbit just a rabbit, then what do we know? And I answered myself, we know very little then. Dear sister, have you forgotten that I am question woman? Have you forgotten that I cannot remember a single story, which is why I must ask always you questions in order to hear the answers again? Ah, uh, yes, I guess I forgot, answered answer woman. But in any event, there is something else I must tell you about the animals and plants and their stories. And that is, asked question woman, in addition to knowing each animal's story, we must see that in its story there will always be the stories of other animals too. In that way we are reminded of how all of life on the mountain is connected, that in fact all of the stories together 
make up the one big ongoing story of the mountain, the lesson we must never forget. I think I understand, said Question Woman, at least for the moment. For example, in the story about Waterbug, you can see other creatures' stories. Eagle is in Waterbug's story. Waterbug's story becomes part of her story, too. Yes, even a creature seemingly as simple as Waterbug is connected to great creatures like Eagle and important to them. What is Waterbug's story? It's the story of how Waterbug stole water. Water is a creature, too? A spirit like the others? Oh, yes, answered Answer Woman. Water is a most important spirit. Listen to the story. Waterbug walks away with Copeland Creek. This happened at the big village near the headwaters of Copeland Creek. Waterbug had lived there with his many grandchildren years before his old wife had left him. He was a stout little old man with skinny short legs. Though he worked hard and helped his many grandchildren, he was often irritable and people usually tried to avoid him. It wasn't just because he was old that he was irritable. He had been a rather unpleasant character all of his life. Some people said he went around and mad because he was born short and had skinny legs. Other people said it was just his nature to be hot-headed. One morning, after he complained unmercifully about the pinole his old wife had served him for breakfast, she stood by the creek and said aloud to the open sky, How long do I have to put up with him? And in that moment, she rose into the sky and became an eagle, the greatest of soaring birds. <laughs> Many miracles happened there at the water's edge. Once a plain-looking lizard found himself with a blue tail, and that is how blue-tailed skink was born. And it was at the creek's edge that Spider taught the people to weave beautiful baskets after a girl had gone to the creek to fetch water for her sick grandmother. I have no way to pack water back to my sick grandmother, but with my cupped hands, the girl said, Spider stepped forth from the willows and said, Don't cry, young girl. I will teach you to weave a basket so tight you will be able to pack water with it to your grandmother. So the creek was sacred to the villagers. Its water taught people many lessons about life, reminded people of many important stories, not least that every living creature needed water and thus was united by the creek. Everyone needed water. Each morning, people cleansed themselves in the creek, starting the day with the water's blessings. They offered scraps of food to the water, as well as songs and prayers and gratitude for the water's many gifts. They didn't want the beautiful flowing creek to forget them. One late fall day before the rains, when the hills were very dry, Waterbug spied a woman bend down and drink from the creek with her lips. It was deer, and she was an attractive woman. Waterbug was resting under a good-sized bay laurel tree there. As he sat, he noticed that many people came and drank water, bending down and taking the water with their mouths. Of course, this was not unusual, for he too drank water from the creek in this fashion. But he had never paid such close attention before. He had never sat so long watching others. He was amazed at how each person came and bent down and kissed the water. If only I could be water, then everyone would kiss me, a crabby, stout man with skinny legs, he thought. <laughs> the idea was crazy, and it made no sense, and Waterbug knew it. But when he saw Quail, the most beautiful woman of all, stoop and kiss the water, he lost his mind, for he could not <laughs> stop thinking about her lovely, soft lips on the water. He stood up then and went to the creek's edge and spoke thus. Oh, I do not want to know all of your secrets, but only your song that enchants all to kiss you. I am an irritable old man with no wife, and I am short and stout with skinny legs. Certainly no one will kiss me without your song. The creek did not answer him. Again he said, Oh, I do not want to know all of your secrets, but only your song that enchants all to kiss you. I am an irritable old man with no wife, and I am short and stout with skinny legs. If I could just borrow your song for a while, I would be able to get someone to kiss me. Still, the creek did not answer him. All right, have it your way, you old thing with moss on your edges, Waterbug said to the ut with utmost bitterness. He walked off, but as you might imagine, he was not satisfied. He kept thinking about Quail's lips, and he was determined to get the creek's song. I know what I'll do, he said to himself. I'll kidnap the creek and force him to give me his song. I'll hide him in a secret cave and starve him until he gives me his song. 
which is just what Waterbug did, but not until he had made careful plans. He had to make sure that no one saw him kidnap the creek and that he had plenty of time to get to the far side of the mountain with his prisoner. Since night was the best time to carry out this deed, Waterbug figured he would only have to worry about the folks who traveled about after dark, such as raccoon, bobcat, and owl. An expert fire maker, Waterbug called these night creatures together and offered to teach them how to make an enormous bonfire. Thus, while teaching these night fellows, Waterbug made an enormous bonfire around which they immediately began relaxing and telling one another stories. Then Waterbug hurried off to the creek. He built a dam and then pushed the dam closer and closer to the creek's headwaters until he was able to fit all of the creek's water in a carrying basket. Thus, with the water in his basket, he trudged to a secret cave on the far side of the mountain. Now you will give me your song that enchants all to kiss you, he said to the water trapped in his basket. Water said nothing. All right, have it your way, Waterbug said angrily. No one will find you here and you will starve and die. In the morning, the villagers were alarmed to find that the creek was gone. All that was left was a trail of sand and dry rocks. What has happened, the villagers cried. Have we offended our beloved creek in some way? Days and nights went by and still water did not return. The villagers stood on the dry sand and prayed. They offered good panola and fine baskets and necklaces and still there was no water. What are we going to do, they wondered aloud. We will die of thirst, each and every one of us, and the mountain will turn to stone. Meanwhile, Waterbug hiked to the secret cave each night and asked Waterbug for a song. Water trapped inside Waterbug's basket was growing smaller. Soon there would be nothing left of him. He would starve and die, just as Waterbug had said. He figured he had to give Waterbug his song, for if he did not, he would surely die, and then there would be no chance of him ever making it back to the village again. All right, he said at last, I will teach you my song. And he sang thus, bending to me, you see your love, bending to me, you see your wide open eyes, everywhere I go, everywhere I go, like that, like that, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> then off went Waterbug with the song. However, in, uh, however, nothing in the village changed. But then why would it? Waterbug had left water trapped in the secret cave and forgot about him there. Soon it was winter and still there was no water in the creek. It rained, but the creek remained a trail of sand and dry rocks, unable to collect the water that fell from the sky. The salmon hovered at the creek's dry mouth near the Laguna de Santa Rosa, unable to make their way up the creek to the village. I am starving, said Bear. I have no salmon to eat. I am starving, said Blue Jay. I have no nuts to eat. The acorn trees are drying up. I am starving, said Sparrow. I have no seeds to eat. The grasses are all dried up. We are all starving, the villagers cried. We are all starving, and we are dying of thirst. They continued to pray and sing songs and make offerings to the creek, but to no avail. Each night, raccoon, bobcat, and owl made a big bonfire the way Waterbug had taught them, and everyone in the village gathered around the fire to discuss what they might do in order to bring Copeland Creek back. At one point, raccoon remembered that the night before the creek disappeared, Waterbug had offered to teach him and bobcat and owl how to build a huge bonfire. We have been tricked, Raccoon said. Yes, Bobcat said. Waterbug kept us busy so that he would not s we would not see what he was doing. Certainly Waterbug walked away with Copeland Creek, Owl said. Waterbug, sitting with the others by the fire, denied any wrongdoing. Why would I want to kidnap the creek, he asked. At that point, Quail stood up. I'll tell you why you wanted to kidnap the creek, she said. So you could kiss me each morning, you terrible old man. Quail was furious for each morning she had been enchanted by Waterbug. Now Waterbug knew his secret was out. All right, he said, I will bring water back to the creek. When Waterbug got to the secret cave, he looked inside the basket and found that there was only a single drop of water left. Hurrying with the basket, he ran to the creek. But alas, when he emptied the single drop of water into the dry creek bed, nothing happened. The single drop of water rested in the tiny crevice of a rock. The creek is so offended it won't flow, cried Quail. But it was Eagle, 
Waterbug's former wife, who swooped down and said, Remember, each spirit on this earth has a special song that gives it life and power. I bet that miserable old man Waterbug, my stout, skinny-legged ex-husband, has Creek's song. I do not have Creek's song, Waterbug said. But Eagle would not believe him. She clutched him in her sharp talons and lifted him straight into the sky, so high that Waterbug not only saw his village far below, but also the great length of Copeland Creek, where the trees and grasses had turned yellow and brown, and where villagers up and down the creek bed were starving and dying of thirst. Spit out the song, demanded Eagle. Spit it out. Waterbug still denied he had the water song. He was still thinking of quail's lips touching his. I have no patience with you, Eagle said, at which point she let go of Waterbug with one of her talons, causing him to gasp, expelling Waterbug's water song, which fell to earth as a single drop of water. That drop of water fell into the tiny crevice where Waterbug had left water after he had dropped him out of the basket. That way, the two drops of water, one being water and the other being water's song, began to grow, and Copeland Creek flowed once more. Meanwhile, Waterbug was still dangling from a single talon. <laughs> Before Eagle was all the way back to the earth, Waterbug fell, causing both of his skinny legs to bend so that his feet were pointing backwards. The people of the village took no pity on him. Coyote, the chief, came forward saying, I think the proper punishment for Waterbug would be to feed him to the hungry salmon making their way back to our village right now. And it was then that the creek spoke to Coyote and all the people of the village. No, if you do that, if you kill Waterbug, you will forget what happened here. Better to forgive him and give him a job cleaning the water and guarding the creek on late fall days when the water is low and someone might attempt to steal it away. The people of the village agreed and thanked the creek for the good advice. Waterbug went to the water then, and that is why in late summer and early fall, you find him keeping watch over the creek gliding over the water's smooth surface, gliding backwards because his feet are still pointing in the opposite direction. <laughs> Um, so, Betty, I don't know how much time I have, and if you wanted to ask questions or other people wanted to ask questions. Uh, well, you're the I'm boss. Hear another story. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to take some questions now? Yeah, I'll do questions or whatever you want. I'm, I'm here. So, another story. <laughs> yes. I have two questions. One is, what is panol? It's like a gruel, or you mix together seeds and like. Um, um, if you, you know, you, there's, we have kind of canola now in the health food stores where you mix together its different seeds and things. And sometimes I'll, we used to boil it and soften the seeds and eat it to mix together, sometimes just dry. Okay. And the other thing, did you make these? Oh, seeds? I'm sorry. I, I'm so sorry. I usually am good about repeating the question. The question was, what is panola? And you just had the answer. <laughs> Feet backwards, mind backwards. Okay. I've heard some of them are totally imagined. Uh, others are parts of things, stories that I've already heard that are parts of a cycle. That we used to tell them in cycles. And what happens, um, the question was, did I make them up or how much did I make them up? What happens is what we have left from a lot of the stories is what ethnographers collected. And usually they're just slivers. Many of the ethnographers and linguists were just going after language that they wanted to translate and record. And so we have slivers. We don't have whole stories. And then, you know, you'll have a sliver of a Coast Miwok story about fire or hummingbird and that was collected by someone here. And it may have just been somebody talking or it may have been, um, but there were always tons of stories and they were cycles, long stories. And so what happens is we get the, say the hummingbird story becomes the Coast Miwok story. Again, what we're doing is tending to read this like Genesis fixed texts, and there were never fixed texts. Okay. Yes? You said you, said you would uh, tell us something about Mount Tam that we wouldn't like. Oh, Mount Tam, yes. <laughs> I've been putting it off. <laughs> okay. Well, um, this, is, this is what we believe. Well, I believe this. I don't speak for everybody. But um, uh, Sonoma Mountain is a very sacred 
good place to go up and people would get visions and the songs would come from there. Um, and I want to explain this a little bit. Um, Mount Tamil Pius was a poison mountain. That's where the poisoners went to train how to kill. All right, you learn there and how to do things. So I remember once in the 60s, there was a big rock, Janice Joplin, all of them were up there, and all those kids went up there, you know, having a good time. And my, my aunt told me, don't go there, that's bad luck, unless you want to do something bad. Now, let me tell you a little bit, though, qualify the poison. Of course, we used to joke, us, we'd say, because all these people are going up there to get married, and we always say, that ain't going to last long. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, the notion of poison, we, and that, you know, you hear that, and what happened is all things had power. And there were some people who were very powerful. Well, with the dawn of Christianity, you suddenly get this polarizing or bifurcation of good and bad that we didn't have. And the, 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 the Western tradition tended to read it that way. And once we were missionized and Christianized, we, we tended to see a lot of the poison as bad or evil also. So we were scared of a lot of these people, and we cast them as evil. And so the, when, when you don't have that same kind of notion, you might want to see the so-called poisoners in another light. And that is people that kept balance made sure there was balance and fixed things so they weren't. There wasn't. But Mount Tam was the place that I was always told where the people that were be powerful poisoners went to train. And you didn't go up there at all unless you were either kidnapped by a poisoner to be trained or invited up there to be trained. Yeah. Yes, sir. But do you have stories about creation or the the first peoples of the earth? Yes. Um, what happened, do we have stories about creation or the first peoples of the earth? Uh, yeah, it happened that part of this story is part of the cycle here, and it comes in the end of the book. I have another somewhat version. But basically what it is is Coyote, after Frog Woman, uh, he couldn't get anywhere with her, went looking for folks, or another wife, and he went off the mountain and went into the valleys, and um, he saw Junko, the bird there, um, with beautiful stripes, and um, he liked those stripes, and he said, gosh, if I could get that, maybe then a woman would be attracted to me. So Junko says, yeah, it's real easy. All you do is just break your leg and take out the marrow and paint your face. <laughs> so Coyote, being so vain, he had no reason. This is what our stories teach us. He broke his leg, and then Junko flew away and went up to Lake County and said, ha, 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 fool. <laughs> Um, so his leg began to fester and got very bad, and all of a sudden, so he built a sweat house, and he was trying to sweat and go back and forth by a creek there. And, uh, but he kept festering, and all these birds started circling him, including buzzard. And so from each bird, he pulled a feather. And when he was in there, he didn't know what to do, so he just put the feathers in a circle inside the sweat house. And he was out there kind of in a daze and a vision. Um, really sick and all of a sudden he thought he heard people singing and he looked and he saw all these people coming out of the roundhouse and each feather became one of the nations of the earth or one of the tribes we come from the crow feathers That's, as Mabel McKay used to say whether you believe it or not it's true Thank you very much. Um, I have it in several essays, and I, in fact, I was talking to Mark and Jane and Angela on the way down here. I have uh, three books ready to send out, and one of which is a collection of essays. Many is, are about the area. About One is about uh, the women's bear cults, and two women from Santa Rosa, one of whom I went to catechism with her great-granddaughter. Um, the two last w w human bears that we know f that were from Sebastopol, they were sisters. And, um, and, uh, and, and I wrote about my, our great-grandmother, Maria or, uh, Supu, other, her Christian name was Maria Cheka. I wrote about her called The Last Woman of Petaluma, and I talk about the culture there. I've written about Tole Lake, and I've just, uh, Betty's just got the last recent article that's going to come out from the big book that the League of Redwoods is doing about the Redwoods, called The Ancient Ones. So in all my writing, 
I try to weave the stories, but make them contemporary. The problem that happens in our world too often is that we want Indians to be pieces of ethnography. And for me, it's living. So you're going to get it how I'm getting a glimpse of what it was like to be a human bear. Or I start off the Redwood thing, the story about the Redwoods, because this cousin of mine in Tooch would remember her, um, and Angela and I know other folks would remember her. Uh, she had love medicine. And I remember once she called me to her house. A couple times people tried to give it to me. When I was a young man and didn't know any better, a man in the neighborhood who at 90s, um, he was a jack of all trades, had love medicine, sold heroin, and had young girlfriends. Uh, but he tried, to, he, tried to give me, he tried to give me love medicine, because when you have a lot of these things, you can't die until you pass it on. That's part of the rule. So you can't, and then of course, when it works, you're stuck with the person. So um, anyway, I remember going to Mabel McKay, and she said to me, uh, she told me all the warnings. She says, don't do this because of these things. But then she said, you're good looking, she said, enough. She says, try the regular way. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the way I actually start the essay, a long way around to start the essay, is that um, I went to see this, she actually was a cousin of mine, uh, Ars Tuch, and uh, she wanted me to take her to uh, teach me love medicine. And she used it. She told many stories. She was a character, and she talked about how this husband had left her for a younger woman. She was at the Kashaya Reservation. Her husband found another woman up at Point Arena. And uh, she was crying and all of that. And her old aunt, wanting to pass on, they watch when you're weak, they watch when you're weak, <laughs> said, I can help you get him back. I'll teach you this if you'll take my song. So apparently she did. She told me this, and she said she started singing the song and using the redwood pitch. There's a couple pitches, and there's a song. I'll tell you the song in English. It might not start work. This has only got one line, and you say it four times. Your name is on my lips. So a few things to go with that. But anyway, she told me that part. And then um, she told me the story about how this guy, when she started using this love medicine on him, started following, showed up on her back porch in the middle of the night saying, oh, please take me back. Please, sweet one, I'm in love with you, all of this. She said he followed her even to the movie theater in downtown Santa Rosa in the old days. And he was sitting behind her, just kind of breathing on her neck. And she said, during intermission, she says, you know what I did? She said, I pulled up my dress, bent over, and said, kiss my ass. <laughs> yeah, our Indian women are very powerful. But Remember, in the old days, there was no such thing as rape. Remember that thing about medicine I told you? You wouldn't dare violate anybody physically. It would come back on you. Rape was a totally foreign concept to us. Um, and the women, to this day, are, are very strong. Um, and um, we respect them. I mean, really strong leaders. And, uh, you know, you didn't mess with them because you don't know what they can do to you. I wouldn't. <laughs> Um, Is that Betty used to enjoy beat the hell out of me when I was little? Oh. Yes, my great grandmother uh, threatened to cut his arm off, and uh, but uh, she, uh, well, they used to say all kinds of things about her that she would poison and do things. Um, I don't do that, <laughs> but never believe anybody who says that. <laughs> I remember Mabel McKay once said. Uh, we were somewhere and uh, somebody was dancing using Mrs. Parrish's songs and they weren't supposed to do that. They're still dancing around here today and Mabel was still alive and they were at the junior college showing off dancing. They saw Mabel coming and in the middle of their songs and singing, they got up and they just stopped singing and ran away, ran away from the crowd. I said, Mabel, what happened? And she says, they think I'm going to hoodoo them. And I said, well, Mabel, you wouldn't do that, would you? And she says, no, but... I don't know what the spirit's going to do. <laughs> As my great aunt Susie used to say, this business, Indian business is kind of kooky, ain't it? <laughs> yes. So I was intrigued when you told us that it took 
it took four Indian women to select a chief. So tell us, tell me more about that. Um, I wasn't living in those days. The question is um, about the four women choosing, electing, choosing the the chief, who would be the leader. And that was generally true, particularly in a lot of the Miwok territory down here. It changed a little bit as you go north. But down here it was very strong. And um, it was usually, I'd say four, but I, I don't know, it was a group of old, usually older wise women who made it their business when some guy retired or got old that they would pick the person. In the village, or you could nominate whoever you like, Right, I nominate you, I nominate you, I nominate you. But they will decide among themselves whether they want one of the nominees or somebody else. Once that person is selected, they take him and then train him for many years in the art of leadership and elocution, speaking, how to speak. Years. You say. Years. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's very, you know, I always got such a joke when you hear all these stories from the old people. And, you know, when I used to see the hippies and all that, just thinking they would be Indians with beads out and nature free like Indians. You don't want to be like Indians. It's a lot of work. Yeah. It was very strict culture and mindful of everything around you. Yeah. So. Yes? This is a little off topic, right? But remember we were I love off topic. Yeah. Remember we Okay, well, thank you for bringing that up because, you know, I took so much heat. Now, I, you know, just for about this casino stuff. I, folks, had never been in a casino. I have a PhD in modern thought and literature from Stanford. What in the world would he know about a casino? But I worked very hard to get my tribe its rights back. We were illegally terminated in 1958. And then after uh, I had made a movie with Robert Redford, anybody can write a bill. Getting it out of the hoppers, that's, that's where you see the limits of democracy. It's who you know or how much money you have. Um, but I knew Robert Redford, and he helped. And we got the bill. Uh, President Clinton signed the bill restoring our rights to the cri tribe uh, on December 27, 2000 two weeks before he went out of office, and to this day we're the last tribe in the United States of America to be restored by an act of Congress. So, um, but they promised us a land back, but they weren't going to buy it. And all of us live in Marin and Sonoma County. Real estate ain't cheap. We have nothing. Oh, you can have land. Yeah, well, who's going to give it to us? So we tried organic cheese. We tried all this. And everybody wanted us to buy the land, but nobody was going to give us the money to buy the land. They wanted to be on an Indian reservation so they didn't have to pay taxes. It was a good deal. Going nowhere, I'm a professor of English at UCLA, and people began to discuss the C word, not cancer. And um, so uh, I didn't want to get involved. I mean, I wanted to help my dad's people, but uh, I really didn't want to get involved. But then my mother, my non-Indian mother, said to me, you can't leave your dad's people now. They're going to go a casino route, whether or not you lead them. And there's so many good examples of bad examples of Indians getting ripped off, of poor leadership, and all that kind of stuff. So um, having a natural mother who's Jewish and being raised Catholic, I'm so full of guilt you can get anything you want from me. So, um, uh, it's all my mother's fault. Um, so, um, I said okay, and I said only if we can do it so that it'll benefit Indian and non-Indian alike. Only if it can be a ticket with its mission being environmental stewardship and social justice will I do it. The folks agreed. Tooch was one of them. And, um, so away we went. I suddenly, and it, we picked the wrong part of land, we had some problems getting off the ground, and, but people went wild. Indians in casino, that's not being Indian. Well, since when is Safeway Mormon? Um, you know, um, so, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff that comes up, you know, you know, we, if, if, you know there's two stereotypes of the American Indian that persist. The fallen nature god. They love us to weave baskets and talk about nature and all of that as long as we're defeated. But once it becomes a question of power territory, the other stereotype gets in for wagon burners. 
So Greg, who writes these books, who was Sonoma County's native son at one point, wow. now becomes a wagon burner. And death threats, all of this sort of thing. Very long story short, we open, bill, I borrow a billion dollars. Um, that's a B. That's a B. Yes, B, that's a B. Um, build the casino. And I'm very proud to say that we did, I did a precedent setting compact with the governor where Jerry Brown allowed me to give the, you have to do a revenue share with your profits to the state. He allowed me to give the bulk back to the county and the city for environmental restor, uh, restoration and, and social justice issues. But practice what you preach. We currently have 2,000 employees in the casino, all of them working 20 hours or more a week, and that's 2,000 of them that are doing that, all have the Kaiser Gold Cadillac plan. They and their families pay nothing out of their paycheck for full coverage. $10 deductible for brain surgery or aspirin. Um, I check every year in glasses. 2,500 deductible, non-deductible uh, non each year. You can use it for orthodontal. We feed everybody breakfast, lunch, and dinner 24-7. And the impact on Sonoma County, which is notorious, of course, it's the wine country, where the, they've been exploiting the Latinas, something awful in the hotels where they work over the weekends and they're not during the week and get nothing, is that they've had to raise the salaries because all the people are coming to Grayton. Now, my next target, the vineyards. We are now planting huge organic gardens. We're started in farms. And in the casino, because it's federally regulated, you can't hire undocumented people. But on our farms, and the county can. So they will pay the people who work on the farms the same benefits and wages that we give in the casino. And that way, I will stop the horrible exploitation that's going on in the vineyards right now. So, um, and as you know, yes. I want to say something. Oh, you work there. She works there. Oh, I don't like that. I didn't say something. It's, 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 it's not a really good I didn't just tell you. It was not Check a plan. It out. This was not, not a plan. I haven't been to any of his talks, but I have to say this. Check this out. <laughs> I love so, you. Check too. this out. I, try, I'm going to try it real, real quick, but I was born in Nevada and I've never moved away very far. And I wrote a, a little card just saying, best wishes with your book. I'm not the greatest speaker or writer. I started with one card that I had at my house. I got to go back a little bit. I was in a casino and I was walking down the hallway and it said, like us on Facebook. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I did that, but I'm not sure. So I went home. I got on Facebook to make sure I had liked and I did. And then I binge watched because sometimes I stay up late, you know, because I'm already staying up to like two. I watched a whole bunch of um, videos that you've recorded on the from the casino from the beginning, from everything, from everything you just talked about. So the only reason I'm doing this is I feel like it was real appropriate to the moment. So, and one thing you don't know that my I heart's know, going. I mean, one thing you don't know that that you don't know that I didn't know. I didn't even know about the organic farms and my daughter who got a full ride to Wellesley, who was very intelligent, who's been to the Peace Corps and everything, came back and was working on an organic farm that's been in Marin for 12 years, right? And the guy wasn't treating the workers right, Greg, and she was feeling really, really torn because she's really into equality. Limousine liberals, things. you gotta watch out for them. Shoot, dude, and so she was living in a yurt on the farm, and she was the only one who had medical and all this other stuff. So, so um, this is just funny, I love his sense of humor. The first card that I wrote, I started and I wanted to say so much that it got really crazy and I'm like, oh my God, he's gonna think I'm nuts, dude. Because it wasn't, it wasn't very well, like, uh, no, organized. No, 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 only because I know you're like a literary, like, and you speak really well. People. And I know you would Nobody will that. write me a love letter and I'll correct it. I'm just saying, so, so anyway, um, one of the things I said is, you know, I was born in Nevada, but I love working at the casino because all the people that I've met there from all over the world, from, and different cultures, Philippines, Cambodians, just everybody. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm like a Anglo mutt 
you know, kind of more, I don't even, I know I'm German, English, Irish, Swedish, but just the information on what happened with co colonialization. And I just, I just watched a whole bunch of videos in a row. So my brain was like, <laughs> and so, you know, and, um, but the, I can say that I wanted to just say I really appreciate how you treat everyone. That I try to learn all their names. You did, did I'm that. Telling, yeah. yeah. No, how, how, I go how, there every night. Oh yeah. And, and I told him one day I was in the casino. I said, I said, dude, you know, because we have soft serve ice cream and I love it. And um, with sprinkles. And, yeah. And so um, I was like, I was like, <laughs> he said, yeah. At the casino, they treat everybody so well. After about three months, we have to give them a bigger size pants. <laughs> That's the only. They're being taken care of. And you can read this later, but I'm going to get one of your books and thank you for letting me you, say something, you. okay? Yeah. Oh, man, my heart's pounding. Oh, back there, my heart. Isn't she supposed to be at work? <laughs> and also, you know, like, I'm going to get something, so it's like, I could do another, I can, I'm getting taken care of, and I already raised my kids, so they're not, but, you know, I can be, I can have freedom to do other things and still have, do you know how much it would cost somebody to have medical insurance alone if they had their own business? Like, there's people there that are doing other things, but they're also being taken care of. And I want that. That's a big deal. And I just wanted, this kind of in a nutshell says thank you for, for uh, fighting for everyone else's, you know, rights and benefits and that, that I'm really benefited by that. And what I feel is that as a leader, this goes on with the Indian spirit, is that, you know, you go from this one thing, what you just said about the, all of a sudden you're a wagon burner or something, is that I would want you to be protected from any of that energy coming your way because I know in my heart that you have taken care of so many people. You're doing it right now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, uh, that was, she's not a plant. No, he didn't know. I've never and I didn't even know that question. Usually I won't open that. Tell us more about the social justice you guys are doing. Social justice? Well, just down the street we have something very special. Any of you, I'm looking at this crowd, most of you have heard of a person named Joe Baez. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Well, some of my young folks in the tribe go, who's that? And I said, well, have you heard of Bob Dylan? Oh, wasn't he one of the Beatles? No. You heard of Martin Luther King? Uh, anyway, um, Joan has uh, become a very good friend of mine. And um, uh, from a, with her action with, uh, on behalf of American Indians and so forth, and she was very taken with the whole program. Um, uh, so, um, what the tribe, she did a series of paintings, beautiful paintings of 16 paintings of the folks that she's worked with over the years in social justice, Martin Luther King, all of them. They were here at the Seeger Gallery right down the street. Remember those? The tribe bought all of them. And we are going to hang them in the Social Justice Center, which we're building at Sonoma State University, Yay. where they will be archived in perpetuity. Um, we're also going to produce a film that she's doing. And um, I guess I can tattle on her. Um, she partied with us a couple nights, including New Year's at the casino. I said, do you want to go somewhere quiet? She goes, no! <laughs> So, um, the first time she came, it was wonderful, it was a year or so ago, and it was on Mark, yeah, Martin Luther King Day, and I thought, okay, because I have questions about the casino, I mean, we're just now doing a huge, we have non, no smoking in the hotel, or no smoking in the restaurants, so we have non-smoking sections, but we're now building a whole non-smoking um, gambling section, and there's things that I don't like, I mean, I wish there was no gambling, or but no drinking, and I mean, the wineries never talk about the drugs or alcoholism, but something somehow uh, somebody yeah. can make judgment about people who gamble. But anyway, um, I, she was here on Martin Luther King Day a year ago, dancing at the sports bar. And I thought, OK, Greg, it's OK. Joan Baez is in your casino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a wonderful person. A fabulous person, and uh, uh, so, yeah. What more? I think we're, I think we're ready to close up and sell some books. That would be great. And I wish I'd bought Betty next time. Do another event, and I'll do the skunk story. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Betty, for the introduction. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Betty. Thank you all for coming this evening. Stay and buy the book. Thank you.